Hello, everybody. Welcome into another episode of Debate Night. We are back once again with a new set of topics, a new cast, and it should be an interesting show. Um, we have a emergency substitution play today. Kate is stepping in. Uh, had to hop in from one of our other analysts that had to uh, uh, step out. He had something pop up. So just keep that in mind when you're watching the show today. Cade cannot be accused of reading notes. He doesn't have notes. He's going straight <laughs> off the dome today. Um, but uh, yeah, so it should be a great show, though. Cade's a capable guy. Um, about to be playing a pro tour pretty soon, we just learned. So that's pretty oh, exciting. Nice. Um, but yeah, we're also joined today by Brody. Yeah, I'm in a weird spot today. You know, man of the people went back, read the comments like I always do. Normally, I kind of sort from the top to bottom to get a good census on what people thought. Here's where here, this was basically starting from the top. These okay. were the comments. Hunter has so much patience to debate with Brody. Guy can't admit when he's wrong. That had 18 <laughs> likes. The idea of imp uh, improved competition as well as people getting worse as they age are not mutually exclusive ideas. That had 38 likes. Oh, Brody yelling is annoying AF. That's 10 <laughs> likes. Someone give Brody a Snickers. He's not him when he's hungry. 13 likes. <laughs> RIP to my ears. Brody, you don't need to raise your voice to be heard. That's 12 likes. If Brody switched to MVP, he could represent their angry line. That is 10 likes. What? Now, if you keep scrolling, though, like if you scroll okay. past a bunch of other comments, the comment that had the most likes with 47 okay. says Brody is 100% correct. Claiming people got worse has nothing to do with the conversation. Brody, don't back down. So I don't know what I should do. This it episode. sounds like change nothing. Change nothing. I don't, I'm just going to keep firing at the yeah. hip. If you guys don't like the yelling, I'm sorry. If someone says something no, that I find ridiculous, uh, you know, it is what it is. Yeah, no, opinions are split. We got to, we got to move on and just, yeah. I take mean, this past salt. leaderboard's got to be tough for you guys. Got to be tough. That's got to be tough for Dave's you guys. Dave's show. I don't know what you're talking That's about. That's got to be tough. <laughs> That's got to be tough. Didn't even make it to the first question. Um, <laughs> we're also joined by Jack today. <laughs> How's it going, everybody? There's been a lot of conversation in the last couple of weeks about uh, having notes versus not having notes. And uh, it all started with me a couple of weeks ago when Brody seemed to take exception and uh, the comments seemed to take exception. And, you know, I am a man of the people, so I'd like to take this moment to apologize to absolutely no one. I've been on this show twice. I've made the finals twice. I've lost twice, but the final question has been the only one that I haven't had good notes for. So I'm going to keep <laughs> doing what I'm doing and you can get over it. I was, oh yeah. Heck yeah. I, was, I was half expecting Jack to pull in with a, with a Apple vision pro. Teleprompter. He's got like the fake him. eyeballs on the other side big old notebook. <laughs> nice. Uh, and like I mentioned, Kate's here today. Um, pretty soon he's going to be your DDO champion. That'd be insane. My college eligibility would be gone. So, mm. you know, if I've got the lead, you might see me uh, lay Worth a few it. up. That would be, be tough, awesome. <laughs> it'd be a tough decision to make, I'll say. There would be oh, no yeah. better ad for college disc golf than if you laid up when you're about to win a pro tour and they <laughs> ask you and you're like, I just wanted to play nationals next year. Like, <laughs> you gotta get nationals one more year. If you get second, you can still play, but if you win, you can't. Correct. Yep. That, that's that's just another well, is there, they've rule. changed the restrictions because is it still a money thing or is it like pro tour win you're gone like what's the thing they, so i've been talking with eric and it's he says that there is a certain cash per year but yeah. he says that's not clearly defined and they define it by a premier professional so however you want to interpret that yeah but it's an a tier ambiguous. or a pro tour well you'll no longer be eligible an a tier gets you that's disqualified to they, yeah. back in our day back in the old college days they always called it a touring pro and it was defined by like if you were the rule was if you were a thousand rated plus you could make three thousand dollars a year was the line if you're under a yeah. thousand it was five thousand dollars but they it's always said so much if you're a touring pro or premier pro and it's like the super vague line to where like yeah. you had people yeah. just like no clue if they could play or not huh. the good really... news was back then college disc golf didn't enforce any rules so True. you didn't even have to go to the school. Yeah, guys that even yeah, I say there's guys playing <laughs> that didn't even go to the schools. Different I want to see people now though. I want to see people start hitting the transfer portal. Yeah, yeah I want to see. Aid. Is it where, happening? Where are you transferring to? Yeah, I'm not transferring, but 
This oh, version of the people transfer in. portal is just people going to grad school. Oh, we might just got we might have just got a, a like breaking news. I've, Someone's I've coming already, to Emporia State. I've already said too oh. much. Oh, oh my goodness! You oh, get no. getting Benji. blue chips. Benji Zorn's coming I'd to Emporia State. State just is bro. getting absolutely stripped of all his We just we just signed him. Ah, Clayton, dang it! <laughs> that would never happen, dude. I wouldn't let that stand. Uh, Hunter's here as well. Hi, Hunter. You know, it was funny when the, bro, they were talking about that comment when Brody was reading it. I couldn't tell if they were talking about Brody or me because I get those exact same comments every other time I argue. <laughs> so I don't know. It seems that Brody and I are just the uh, a battle of wits or lack of wits, depending on which side you're on. <laughs> <laughs> well, either way, I'm hopeful. Hopefully, we'll get uh, we'll get back into it today. I think there are some provoking questions, at least one. Um, all right, we're going to get into <laughs> our first topic here. Uh, we're going to talk about probably the one of the. I would well, probably say the biggest storyline that came out of the Music City Open just because of the severity of it. Um, so we had a scary moment at the Music City Open when a threat was made against one of the competitors, um, which later was revealed to be Natalie Ryan. Um, causing play to halt while safety could be assured. Do you think the Pro Tour handled the situation well and should heightened security be a standard moving forward at tour events? Brody, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, it's a tough one to answer. One, I wasn't there. Two, not a lot of information has really come out about like how it was handled with the players, how it was handled with the spectators, at least none that I could really find without actually asking individual people. So I think as far as what I saw, where it was initially, hey, play suspended, then they kind of came out with a, um, I don't know. And again, it's it's one of those things where like, they're dealing with the authorities. And whenever you have the authorities involved, they, a lot of times will tell you what to say and what not to say. So we're not getting the full story. And a lot of that might not be because of the disc golf pro tour didn't want to tell people, but maybe because the authorities didn't want to let people know. I think having uh, an, an officer be on the card of Natty, the Ryan, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and you know, the question of should heightened security be a standard moving forward? This is a tough one because it costs a lot of money. And, you know, right now we, for the most part, the last couple of events I went to, it seemed like there was like one officer person on duty. And a lot of times it was like the person either at the gate, letting people in or whatnot to think to have a much bigger, greater staff than that. Like, for crowds that have a couple hundred people, it just doesn't seem too financial. It doesn't make sense financially. And up until this point, it hasn't really need, need hasn't need been needed. So yeah, definitely. And uh, quite an expense associated with that. Um, Jack, what were your thoughts on it? Yeah, I think that the pro tour handled the situation. Well, uh, the most information that I got about how, what they did was actually from Hunter on grip lock today. Um, but I think that it goes without saying that regardless of why there is a severe threat, um, you know, regardless of what your political beliefs are, your thoughts on transgender athletes, like this is not okay, like at all. I think that can go without being said, but just want to preface with that. Um, I do think we are a little too small for height and security, like you see at a professional baseball game or at a PGA Tour event. I just don't think it's feasible. I think having local law enforcement there just to be a small presence is important. Um, but think about other like big gatherings, like parades and stuff like that. Law enforcement is there, even if it isn't like full lockdown security. Um, as a spectator in the past of pro tour events, I understand wanting to bring, bring big bags of discs in with you. Uh, you want to pack it with certain discs, have certain players sign and everything like that. Uh, but we got to be going through bags like all large events do to make sure that we have no issues there. I kept score for the PGA a few times during uh, Waco this year. and. Um, there was nobody keeping spectators back from uh, the pros or doing a good job of it. Um, in fact, it was given to me as my responsibility with the card that I was walking with, which was third card and had like Gannon Burr and Colbert Dolan on it during the second round. So a pretty popular card. It was my duty to do it. Um, and they weren't listening. I called for backup. They weren't listening to backup either. So I think the biggest safety thing that we can do is we can do a better job of keeping spectators away from players. Yeah, it is kind of the Wild West out there at the moment. Um, Kate, what did you think about the whole situation? Yeah, I mean, I think the Pro Tour did everything that they could do in the situation to um, really not release a whole lot of information initially. And like, even now, I mean, I didn't find any information other than the fact of the statement that they released. And I think that contacting the law enforcement and just basically saying whatever you guys say is what we're going to do. 
like because you don't you don't want to put your players in a situation any player in a situation where you feel like they might be in danger so it was definitely the right call to suspend the play and uh, moving forward with the heightened security um like like everyone said i think that financially we're not there but you don't want to wait for something to happen to cause you to bring the security in um so i don't i don't know what the exact right call call is there if like the local police can come out but i mean you really do have people that are celebrities to a lot of these fans that I mean, people that go crazy about someone, you never know what they're going to do. Um, their intentions may not to be hurt to hurt someone, hopefully not. But you, we just can't have fans getting in the way of the play. And um, I think my biggest argument for why that we need the security is that you don't want to wait for a situation to happen to force your hand to bring the security in. Yeah, certainly the trickiest thing to navigate is like as much as it is an expense, it's like, you don't want to have have to do it uh, after the fact. Um, all right, Hunter, wrap it up. You were there, so I'm sure you probably the most info. Yeah, so I think the Pro Tour, uh, from my standpoint, did everything that they could do, um, especially after the fact. I think they handled it very well. They were able to get play resumed within about an hour, hour and a half um, after the initial stoppage. They got everyone, including fans, off the course, um, and they just made sure everyone was safe because then it was a safe event the rest of the way. Uh, it's an awful situation, um, but it could have been much worse. And we can now use this as a great learning experience for what security should be like at events. Obviously, we can't hire full security detail and stuff like this. But prior to this, there wasn't bag checks. Friday, I walk onto the course, no bag check. I just get my wristband, whatever. Sunday, there's bag checks going on. I think that should be a policy that's at every event. You already have someone working the gate, checking your wristband. It doesn't have to be a law enforcement officer to do the bag check, just have that person check the bags. Also, you can just make a bag policy, a clear bag policies at a ton of sporting events, say no big backpacks. Like you can bring discs in your hand if you want pros to sign it. Signing can also happen off the course like this. The signing area was open to the public and then the course was behind, like you went through the gate past that. So that's another option too. So I think there's a lot of things that we've now had this learning experience where thankfully no one was harmed. Um, Let's use this as a learning experience and not wait until something does happen to make us make adjustments. So, because this easily could have been much more serious, uh, but with the security in place going forward, hopefully this learning moment is just something that we can pivot and prevent it from ever happening again. Yeah, I think the key is like the bag policies or things like that where they're preemptive and they're not, they don't cost anything. It doesn't cost anybody to tell people what they can't bring into an event. Obviously, you might ruffle some feathers, but clear bag policy is pretty typical. You can even have very inexpensive plastic clear bags to hand out at gates that cost almost nothing. Um, you know, there are things like that. And that, that's a huge improvement, right? Like the difference between not having a bag check and having a bag check, that is already a miles improvement because. Um, if somebody's going to really try to do something, odds are they're going to bring something into the event. And that's and that's the biggest thing you want to avoid. So, yeah, I think it's going to be a learning experience. And I'll be just curious to see if we get another statement from the Pro Tour with any kind of updated protocol uh, addressing things moving forward. But, yeah, to an extent, there's only is so much you can do. Obviously, it's not like the PGA Tour where they've got guys that are literally strapped on, like, every single card. It's it's pretty insane what they have to do at that level also, um just to add not really a rebuttal but this is also probably going to lead to the pro tour um heading more to the golf course or established you know more private properties because you know when you get to the parks and stuff it is very hard to have and i'm sure hunter you saw at mill ridge I'm sure people could get on the course if they wanted to get on the course. It would have been hard. There is there was like two areas, but they had trucks parked at those areas. So, I mean, well, I mean, it's a huge, it's a huge park. Is what it's I'm saying. It's, the it's, perimeters it's are not definitely like, more secure at a golf correct. course. We've yeah, got yeah, like yeah. houses. You could walk through the woods or something. Yeah, yeah. you got like houses yeah. around them and things like that. It yeah. wasn't yeah. like Memorial where there's or Waco where there's walking pads. You can just get on from a different part of the park. Sure, sure. Yeah. It was, it well, was a little at bit Waco better. this year. They had everything locked up. At Waco yep. this year, you could only get in from one place, except when they had the rain delay on the first round. They opened it up to let everybody. That sounds out. like a challenge. Do they me. have someone on the sidewalk by the water? If you're coming in from the east, I didn't see anyone down there. If I didn't want to be a scumbag, man. I would That's just make. Point. That's I'd point. make my mission to get into every single. Uh, also, door. you could also. The, they didn't have anyone on the first. What, what's that hole? It's the par four that you can go from. You can go for it with the flex forehand. It's right by the road. What oh, hole? Uh, Coming, seven. You, yeah, seven. hole seven. They don't have anyone there, so you could literally have someone drop you off on the side of the road, yeah. and now you're on the course. That, that's my point. Is like yeah. a lot of these courses that are parked. It's are rare. Really well, even like uh, like the campus just, too at Winthrop. 
Like, I mean, yeah. you could just <laughs> round hole 10, 11, 12, like you could just walk across the, uh, across the street. Exactly. Basically. Yeah. Now keep an eye out for, uh, like one of these, one of these days, you're gonna see me like pop up in a scuba tank inside when the lead cards on one of the holes. <laughs> <laughs> I got in. No, no wristbands. No wristbands. Um. All right, we're gonna move on to our next topic here. Talk about the veterans of the tour, the old, the old guys of the tour. They had a great showing this past weekend with Macbeth, Lazat, Wysocki, Dickerson, and Coling all putting in solid performances, to name a few. How important is it for the game of disc golf that older players can remain relevant and win events later in their careers? Does a lead card like we just saw attract more excitement than a lead card full of the young guns? Jack, what do you think? Yeah, I think for the game of disc golf, it isn't as important as you would think to have leaderboards like this. The young guns are the stars of the sport right now. Most people, when they get invested in a new sport, don't care about the old head who is the best that ever was in his prime. That's old news, and people are looking to the new and current guard as fans so they can cheer them on for a long time. I think for the players who are still trying to have relevance, it is important. The guys we saw at the top are plenty relevant, though, so this doesn't necessarily help them out. But imagine if Johnny McRae, who was playing the event, was on the lead card at a pro tour or major on the final day. The guys old as him with less notoriety would need a performance like that to help his brand. I do think that a lead card like that creates more excitement in theory, not necessarily right now, but in theory. It creates storylines. Now, again, this is a case of the sport being too young for this to feel like it means a ton. Macbeth won Worlds two years ago. He won a Pro Tour event last year. Wysocki has won a ton of Pro Tour events in the last few years. Lazat is bigger now than he ever has been. Coling is the voice of Jomez. So in this case, I don't see it as important or exciting because they are veterans. Like, say, if this were five years from now and these guys hadn't won anything in a while. We as a sport and these guys as players aren't old enough and past their prime enough for this to mean much. That lead card is not the same as Brett Favre, for example, coming to Minnesota in his final year and taking them to the NFC Championship after he hadn't really been relevant for a while. Yeah, fair enough. Okay, good points. Um, all right, Cade, what do you think? Yeah, I think when you look at the lead card that we had this past weekend, I mean, there's everybody was counting out Paul McBeth. Um, and I do think it's important for Paul McBeth to stay re relevant by – I know he didn't win, but he was he played better than everybody besides Simon Lazat. And you know, if Simon Lazat doesn't go out and play out of his mind, Paul Macbeth wins this past weekend. Um, so when I think you you look at and you say how important is it for these players to get on these lead cards to stay relevant, like yeah, sure, Germ can go on Jome as people know who Germ is, but a lot of people associate Germ with a guy who just kind of tours, do whatever, see his buddies, play disc golf and uh do Jome as after the rounds. And I think that Germ doing that definitely puts the relevance back in his name. And I think for the excitement of the game, as when you're looking at fans, I know I was excited to see it. I haven't seen Paul McBeth play live disc golf in what feels like a year at this point. Um, so I think it is important. I think the young guns, the Calvins, the Gannons, the ABs, those guys, they're going to have their time to play. You kind of compare it to like Tiger Woods later on in his career when he's in contention, you know, everyone's tuning in because it's something they haven't gotten to see in a long time and i think that necessarily isn't the case with paul because he's been relevant last year he's been relevant in the years past but it's like you you miss what you haven't gotten in a long time and when you get all these guys who you know 10 years ago were your favorite players and they were the guys every single weekend it's cool to reminisce and remember what used to be and that they're still here to play yeah definitely an element of nostalgia there for sure um hunter what is your opinion on the old guard yeah, I think Kate and Jack are kind of both right for from different angles, because um, I think it's important for fan retention and uh, interest, but it's not like make or break like this question was kind of asking. Because um, for instance, we'll use Paul here, him getting back in contention, got the crowd absolutely rolling both in person and online. I mean, at the vendor village, that was like everyone leading up to lead card. That's what everyone was talking about when you went out on the course. Everyone was on lead card, watching lead card. The gallery was. Um, and I think it could have brought back in some disc golf fans that hadn't watched in a while because to Cade's point, you know, it's been a while since we've seen a Paul lead card. So does it attract more excitement week in and week out, though? I think that all depends on the golf because like Jack was saying, the young guns are the face of disc golf right now. They're popping off all the time. So if Paul were to get back in contention every single week, well, now it just depends on the golf as to whether it draws excitement or not. Because like when you have a player like Paul, or a fan favorite guy like Greg Barsby getting contention. It brings that excitement and eyeballs. But when it's regular thing, then it's all about their personality and golf and not necessarily the age. Like, for instance, we'll use, he just used Tiger. We'll use him there, right? Golf fans, super excited about, well, not all golf fans, but Scotty Scheffler is doing some incredible stuff week in and week out right now. But 
if Tiger were to get in contention at the next tournament he plays, there would be a whole nother guard of golf fans that get reinvested into golf. And they might get introduced to Scotty Scheffler. They might not be watching golf right now, but as soon as Tiger's back in. So I think that's more what the veterans can do is when they pop up on a lead card, then it brings other interest that hasn't watched in a while. Yeah, that's a good point. You can definitely drag people back into things. I know that's happened with golf a number of times. Um, Brody, what are your thoughts? Yeah, wait, Jack, did you say that most, uh, you were saying like the young players in sports are like, that's what draws fans are more interested with the, with that. Is that what you were saying? I think in disc golf, yeah. I think when a guy goes from, you know, you haven't really heard him and he's young and he shows up and he does something crazy, then the fandom shows up. I mean, that's what happened to Gannon Burr when he had his rise to, to glory. Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, I think the new players playing well, everyone gets kind of interested, but you know, you look at someone like Cole Radolin when Cole Radolin won Ledgestone, everyone was going nuts and talking about him. We don't really hear much from him anymore. Right. So this notion, like the players that no one's talking about Cole Radolin, Jack. Okay. It might, Am I wrong? I, I haven't really heard anyone bring him up being like, Hey, where's Cole Radolin? That I don't, I don't see, I don't see when he, I don't see when he's in the top 10 for grip lock. (laughs) I don't, I don't see when he's on fourth, fifth, sixth card, him getting a fan base. Like Paul, when Paul's on fourth, fifth, sixth, 10th card, people are showing up. When Simon is on 10th, 12th card, people are showing up. You look at some other sports, LeBron James, Steph Curry, Tom Brady, Peyton Manning, Ronaldo, Messi, Usain Bolt, Mike, Michael Phelps. People are drawn to greatness over a long period of time. The kids that pop up, yeah, obviously it's like people like new stuff, but the greats, those are what people are drawn to. And seeing Paul Macbeth back in action, that was a huge thing for disc golf this week. And to Hunter's point, it probably did bring a lot of new people to tune in to be like, oh, I haven't really seen Paul play uh, a competitive round lately. This would be interesting. To, yeah. to act like these younger guys are more popular than these these guys, that's that's just not the case, my friend. It definitely, it definitely is difficult. Like the younger players, if you come in and you have maybe the most electric personality ever and you immediately captivate people, but to create the kind of like army fan base that that some of these older guys can have, you have to do it for a long time, kind of like Brody mentioned, I think. I didn't even, t- I didn't even talk about tennis. Tennis is a good one too, because tennis, you've got a couple older guys that are are huge. And then you've got, I, I'm blanking on the kid, the Spanish kid. Um, Alcaraz, is that his name? Al- Alcaraz? Yeah. Who is that fiery guy that everyone's super and interested in? He's awesome. <laughs> yeah. You look at Conor McGregor. Conor McGregor is still the biggest pull in UFC, even though it's you true. have a bunch of younger guys coming up. It's, well, I think it, it, it just, it is what it is. Where you I have think more time to grade that fan base. For your, your day to day sport fan, like you're, like you're really, you, like, great example. Conor McGregor, I'm going to watch a Conor McGregor fight and I'm going to watch the whole card. So because Conor McGregor draws in someone like me who is probably even less than casual, but let's just call me a casual UFC fan. Let's say I was a bigger fan back in the day than I am now. Then that's going to draw me in versus you, Brody. You watch UFC regularly. So for someone Mm -hmm. like you, it doesn't necessarily, like you'll get excited when Conor's back in, but it's not changing your watching habits. So for you, uh, like an up-and-comer who's like dominant, like, you know, we, I use the Scotty Scheffler we, in disc golf, AB. That's super exciting. That's awesome. But for me, that's not making me watch it. So I think Correct. that's where, but if Conor McGregor were to come back and he were to fight like four times a year and by like the eighth or ninth fight, I've lost interest again. Yeah. So it, it's the, that, it has that hit when he, they first come back and then they like are responsible for passing it on almost. So if that's why I don't think the, the question was kind of worded of like, their ongoing relevance almost or remain relevant. I don't know how important it is for older players to be able to consistently remain relevant, but it is important for them to be able to get relevant at an event like Paul just did at Music City, if that makes sense. The casual viewer of any sport is looking for some kind of hook, whether that be a personality or a narrative. And like for a lot of sports, that narrative is playoffs, right? Like a lot of people are only going to watch a certain sport once it gets to the playoffs. I only watch the NBA at the playoffs. Right, because now there's a narrative of, well, A, it's just being covered way harder on platforms, but there's a narrative like a team loses, they can go home eventually. Um, But, you know, and then the other end of that is like the personality. You get that a lot in boxing, UFC. I bet a lot of people watch that Ryan Garcia fight that just happened because of how he sold that fight. Um, So I do think that is a big part of it as well. And yeah, disc golf, it's it's interesting because, 
I think Simon got his falling obviously mostly off of personality and play style. Um, but then some, a lot of players, it's really just been success that's been able to to give them that kind of recognition. But um, it's definitely interesting. It was an interesting event to, to watch for sure. Okay, we're going to step up to an interesting topic here. This is a fan-submitted topic, kind of a rules or course design suggestion. It would kind of be a little bit of both um, that I thought was interesting. So we're going we're gonna to pose it to, to the analysts here and see what they think. The question was, do you think the pro tour should play around with the idea of using a softer material such as sand around the basket to emulate a green of sorts. The idea would be to reduce rollaways that happen after the disc hits the padding around the pole and also encourage more aggressive shots that reward landing near the target. It would also create a defined ear area for stat keeping that would easily be visible to spectators and scorekeepers alike. Okay. What do you think about this idea? Yeah. So I think this is a really good question. And the first place my mind went to was the beach hole at one throw for USDGC. That's a hole where you're trying to get the disc to skip into the green. And you know, if you do skip into the green, you're going to be safe. You're not going to slide off the sand into the water um, unless like you hit the sand first and somehow go off. But um, either way, I think that when you have a shot that it requires you to skip, I like the idea that around the basket is sand, but I don't want to take away on every single hole. Like for example, let's say hole 16 at champions landing. If that was all sand, that would be way too easy because you could throw a spike hyzer right, right by the basket. And, you know, you're staying Let's... by the basket every single time. You don't have to worry about skipping. You can just chuck it into the green and it's staying right there. What's but... Champions Landing? <laughs> DD or a country club, EZC. Oh, it changed the name, yeah. Can I okay. get some time back? Yeah. yeah. All right. Sorry, <laughs> sorry. I, I, I completely forgot they changed the name. Yeah. Keep going. You're good. Um, but really where I'm trying to get to is that the short touchy shots that sand shouldn't be a thing. I think that when you're trying to throw, it's important to be able to land the disc flat and, and minimize ground movement. But on some like longer, like 400 plus par threes, I don't hate the idea that, you know, if you, you, you hit circle one, you're going to be close to the basket. And I think that could be a good possibility moving forward, but I don't want to see it on every single hole. Okay. So Cade kind of likes doing a little bit of a mix up, but likes the idea. Um, Hunter, what do you think about this? Yeah, I think Cade's absolutely right because like that hole at USDGC, like I think this is a great idea as like a uh, a feature in design where you have some type of shot or some type of reason that you want shots to just hit and stick. But I think it's an awful idea to just make this be what greens are in disc golf because it reduces like angle control and touch needed in disc golf, which the sport's already going away from that. That's the roots of the sport. We need to keep as much of that in the game as possible. And rollaways on approach shots, a lot of times, can just be avoided by shot shape. So, like, if you're going into a hill and you're just throwing a forehand spike, like, forehand spike hyzer into the side and then getting ticked, it rolls away. Well, no shock that someone who throws an anhyzer that flattens doesn't get the rollaway as much. Like, there's different angle control things that players can do if they're not, but most of them are, that if there was just sand there, then everyone's just throwing the spike hyzer and it, it makes the game easier if you did it on every hole where we don't need the sport to be easier. Also, rollaways on missed putts. I know that's what a lot of people are talking about. Maybe you missed the word there. Missed putt. You just make the putt, it doesn't roll away. Pretty simple there as well. Um, so making the greens out of the sand, I think reward far more bad shots than it would prevent good ones from getting screwed. So I think it's a good like design feature that can be considered here and there, but it needs to be very strategic and not just a blanket. Let's put sand around every basket so people can just throw spike hyzers and forget about the touchy part of the game. Okay, okay. Um, Brody, what do you think? Should we have some some sand greens? No, definitely not. Um, I'll also add to champions landing. I know they just bought that, but there has got to come a point where we, we stop renaming courses and also stop redesigning courses. I watching, watching the tournament back. I had no idea what was going on. And I'm thinking now, like if I didn't play the course, it's gotta be so confusing for a lot of people when the courses just change all the time. So I was just going to throw that out there, but yeah, I, I think Hunter's nailed it. I think everything he said, I agreed um, to add to that. One thing that I would like to see is for them to start doing something that Belton did way back in the day before the tour said, we don't want to play here anymore. They, they shaved the circle one first that like looked nice, like seeing tighter grass around there. But also I think you can get a little creative with, making certain areas, you know, let's just go super crazy and say um, half the green 
half of circle one on the left is going to be tile. Now, obviously, this would look oh. terrible. This would look terrible. You could also maybe say like hard pan dirt or something. But the idea that shots that miss left of the basket are going to skip and be farther away than shots that end right of the basket. I think one that's going to increase people having to get like more accurate and more consistent. And then also, I think it makes it to um, a little bit more strategy involved on where you're trying to throw your shots. I think I do think that disc golf kind of writes off the idea sometimes that like they can do things with the ground that change the game. Like imagine if near a bank of water, it was the shortest can. grass on the entire course. Yeah, well, I know resources, yeah. but yeah. Yeah. Well, I've been saying a lot of these parks, they just won't even allow them to like cut a tree or stuff well, like that. When but... I show up to New London with a bag full of tile, I hope they're yes. ready for me. Yeah, <laughs> um, but I'm with you, Hunter. I think, or Trevor, I, I think it would be cool to see them start manipulating ground when they yeah. can around the basket. There's a lot of possibilities. There is. Yes. Um, Jack, do you like the sandy green or not really? Yeah, absolutely not. Uh, landing a disc soft is part of the importance of disc golf and makes it challenging. Uh, hole nine at Music City Open was the best example of this. In that final round, Macbeth threw a drive that was low, came in on an angle that was likely to skip, and he did and rolled out of bounds. If he had hit the ground softer, played it higher to, the, uh, to that the angle was more of a spike, then it may not have been an issue. I do think that pads, plastic structures, and other things need to be cut out of the Pro Tour entirely. We've seen it make significant impacts on tournaments in the past. Pads and stuff, meaning like around the basket. Um yeah, need to be just cut entirely. Um, in Jonesboro in 2022, hole five, which two weeks ago was hole six, uh, 18. In the final round, Macbeth threw a flex up the middle. It was like six inches low being an ace. It would have been insane. And it hits this plastic structure and shoots directly backwards out of bounds. I mean, like the disc springboarded off the thing faster than it hit the basket itself. Um, and instead of a birdie, he took a bogey, two-stroke swing on one hole, and he ended up in a playoff that we all know is T-pad gate. So making the ground softer to minimize the reaction of a disc off the plastic things and the pad around the basket is dumb. Just get rid of the plastic thing altogether. Um, and this idea that making this would make stat keeping uh, easier doesn't make any sense at all to me. As long as we're considering the green is within uh, 20 meters of the basket, no matter what. If we change that and being within 20 feet of, uh, or 20 feet away from the basket, but being in brush was considered off the fairway, then okay. That could make sense, but right now, anything, no matter what, within 10 meters of the basket to C1, anything, then 20 meters to C2. So changing it for stack keeping doesn't make any sense at all. Yeah, I think the most the most intriguing idea I had with this green is like I get the idea of like having a giant sand green is way too easy. What I was kind of thinking is maybe the green is like very tight to the basket, so tight that it barely goes out from the edge of the basket, and it's really only going to stop shots that might roll off the pole or hyzers that land like right on top of it, but it's not really going to affect anything that's typically being thrown. Like it's only going to reward the shot that goes that like nestles up to the pole. Like even the shots that skid on the ground and maybe would normally hit the pole and then get a roll, um, like almost like kind of something to trap it. But yeah, I don't know. I don't, I don't know the same. Like I think slime. What is it? Like slime, slime there. Like, yeah. Like just like a rat trap, just right on there. Yeah. I think part of it is like the, the skill level that pros have a lot of us ams watching maybe haven't watched it in person or like aren't aware. So sometimes what seems like bad luck was just a poorly executed shot. Well, it only like, feels that way because everybody gets on Instagram, all the pros and then proceed to comment about true. how they got every that's bad break true. in the world. So they tell us, but I'm saying like, there's some pros that like are in full control, <laughs> throw a bad shot. Like, like Paul probably knew his disc was too low when it got that skip. And he probably wasn't upset, but Paul fans at home might've been like, are you kidding me? Like the course is not blah, blah, blah. Like that, that's the type of situation where like a pro might've missed their intended line by like five feet height wise. And that is all the difference in a disc hitting and sitting and getting some big flare skip. And then viewers at home, like it, it's not as straightforward to watch. I feel like with how much control pros have over angles and stuff like that. Just and you know, like Brody line. was talking earlier of how you can like speed up the arm, slow the wrist and stuff. Like, I mean the, the spin control these pros have is crazy too. Right, Brody. Yeah. I think we have inconsistencies in. in baskets catching that we need to worry about before we worry about what the ground around the baskets like. I think that 
any, so everyone veterans, can agree with that. Veterans Baskets had a tough weekend. A I tough fully weekend. agree, but I've seen so many people disagree with that take, saying like, "Oh, it's part of the sport. You're supposed to learn how to putt on different baskets." That's the stupidest thing. I ever. don't think th- I don't <laughs> think that makes sense to me. But I, I I like that they're trying. I like that. I like that angle. I appreciate. Yeah, the like I mean that's that's like the craziest take to me. Like I get like if a basket if the baskets were standardized and like let's say they went with veterans baskets and all the hard putts were spitting out then you could say like well you got to learn how to putt on like what the basket is this is the basket but a new one every week i mean that's just crazy. Wouldn't, wouldn't the easy solution just be no chains let's just go basket and pull yeah basket and pull basket there's and no pull, there's no bad luck no more aces no one, ever again <laughs> no one in basketball when a when a shot like hits the rim a couple times and drops off no one's like oh my god that was terrible luck like no you yeah. a bad shot didn't go in Right. So if you well, don't so have it sounds chains, like what you want is just all you just want a hole. No, no, no. I want the pull. There's, there's no there's no bias basket. when you when the ball goes through like the hole in basketball, like what could go wrong? It's just gravity. Okay. I think you do need a pull. Okay. But what if the poles are different? What if some poles are a different metal? And so padded, you got a padded pull. Padded pull. Okay. Oh gosh. <laughs> Actually put a big plastic trash can around the pole. Yeah. And then, and then if you hit the trash can, then have y'all ever played those tournaments where they put a trash bag over the basket they're not using? I yeah. shot eighteen hundred. Yeah. Does that make it catch consistently? During during Throw COVID, I shot bag. during COVID, I shot eighteen hundred at a course because they didn't want anyone playing it. So they put uh, they put trash bags over everything, and we just played like, okay, if you hit the trash bag, it's a birdie, oh, and the trash bags were it. like massively oversized, so it had like a huge tail. There was multiple times where I like would airball my putt, but it would nick the little plastic. <laughs> Birdie, nailed it. Perfect. It's like COVID putting when they had. Oh the, my uh, gosh, that was incredible. <laughs> you had all the flag sticks plugged. You just hit it as hard as you hard wanted. As you can <laughs> take the break out of every putt. Yeah. Oh man, love it. But that kind of shows you like how important it is for us to make putting a little bit more difficult because golf. If there was no speed control and putting, like that sport would be stupid to watch. It's true. It's true. I really don't think we've seen the best basket yet. I think that there's a solution out there that we're going to see 20 years from now that's better than. If it takes 20 years, man. Yeah, I hope not. But <laughs> gosh, dude, I, I just say it's I, we don't have the technology yet, Trevor. It's I really be don't think that chains on a pole is the best solution. I, you're not wrong, Kate. Like the, I think that disc golf will. Ne- there's no way that disc golf is ever going to get away from like the chains, but like. There is endless ways to make it a device that catches a disc, and I bet there's probably better ways to do it. Why don't we it. just do Velcro? Just put Velcro. <laughs> when you're about to putt, you put Velcro around your putter, Perfect. and then if it sticks to the Velcro target, then it counts. Like, I'm not even sure. Just saying that on the podcast, there might be a, a witch hunt. Like, I think trying <laughs> to take chains out of disc golf is, like, probably the craziest thing you could suggest. But you're right. Like, the disc is one thing, but as far as like a device that catches the disc, I think here's what they need to do. They need fishing nets. They need to give a bunch of discs to like some really great engineers at like MIT and be like guys that have never seen disc golf ever. If they could, if that's possible. And then be like, make the best device to catch this, this object, this disc. And I just see what people come up with. But you don't want it to be the best to catch because it, it needs to be hard. Enough. Well, I just like to see their ideas though. Yeah. No, I want it to be. The, we can make it as small as we want. I want it to be the best at catching. It just it has to be a certain size. We can we can make it that playground game where you throw it into the big hole, and then there's four <laughs> little there's four little holes, and it can just come out of one of those holes, and then if it comes out the hole and drops in the basket, you then get you, eight, well, like count. one of them's a plus four, one's a minus two. <laughs> yeah. The fishing net, the fishing net. Okay, it's directional, so it only goes yeah. in one way, and then you can change the course by just turning it. That would be crazy. Now you can only enter from the right That's side the of thing. the thing. I saw a post on like Reddit of like a basket that there was only like two ways to enter it. I think it was like a vintage one. And there was like only a couple ways you could enter it. Very cool. Crazy. Well, All uh, kinds of ideas. Think about why not make the actual chains part smaller and make the cage bigger. So you have a smaller part to hit. But if you hit the chains, you're going in. Oh. Endless, endless ideas. We've, we've said that multiple endless times. Ideas. I haven't, I haven't no heard make the basket in. bigger. Well, yeah, I wouldn't make, make the. I, I've never said make the back. I would just say make the chain smaller, so that way now. Yeah, but he's saying because then if you like if it if it slows well, it down. The way he's right. saying it though is going to make putting more easy. No, because if you're making you the target ball, bigger. If you air ball, it's not going in. You're making no, he the, said make the, the chain. Hit. He's saying no. make the chains bigger and no. the basket no. bigger. Chain no. smaller, basket cage bigger. wider. So the cage doesn't need to be. The cage is already wide enough. If you make the chain smaller, then you don't need to make the cage cage even bigger. 
And the cage is wide enough. Normally, when they short, you can still get spit outs. Yeah, you could still get spit outs. We need to test. Well, that's, well, what that's this a bad podcast putt. is proving is there's a lot of ideas. That we need to take a marksman top and track. put it on a normal basket bottom, and then yes. we'll get the we'll get the we'll figure it yes, out exactly. We can test it. More um, air balls. That's what we want to see around here. More right air balls. I've got them. I got them here. <laughs> I'm not. Um, all right, we got one more topic for our finals. Um, now that we've stumbled upon so many great basket ideas, I'm going to talk a little, little bit about the FPO field. Okay. The FPO field parody was once again, poor in Nashville with first and second place, separating themselves from the rest of the field by nine strokes. This has been a recurring theme this season. Third place has been 10 plus strokes from the lead in five out of seven events. The winner has been decided by five plus strokes in five of seven events. This division desperately needs more excitement on the final day. Who is most responsible for these results? Kristen Tatar's dominance, the underperforming high-level players such as Kaylee King and Paige Pierce, or the bottom half of the field that isn't improving quickly enough? Hunter, what do you think? D, all of the above. Thank you. Uh, so this is mm-hmm. kind of a tough question because it, like, it really is, I think, all of the above, but it's working towards a brighter future for FPO because um, Kristen's dominance will only end realistically by players eventually stepping up unless it lasts so long that she just can't play disc golf anymore. Um, her dominance is also creating a generation that's inspired by her and what she's doing on the disc golf course and what she's accomplishing off the disc golf course and want to be just like her. Just like, I mean, all of us, I would assume, grew up wanting to be like Michael Jordan or the equivalent in whatever sport you were obsessed with growing up. That's Kristen Tatar to a lot of young girls coming up in disc golf right now. The problem is the only real solution here I've ever thought through that makes sense is time because i think the time's just needed for the field to increase in skill increase in size which will solve this and like some of the other problems and make it more competitive week in and week out there's no real way to snap your fingers and have someone suddenly be as good as christian tatar or play consistently um or the bottom half of the field just get bigger and better you just need time for all those things to happen so uh yeah i think it's kind of all the above and give it time it'll happen okay Fair enough. I mean, I asked which is most, but all the above. You know. Okay, fair enough. Brody, what do you think? Yeah, I'm I'm gonna answer this question by going completely different. Um, and answering or posing a question for I guess maybe discussion later. Okay. Cause we just kind of talked about, you know, this idea of like these older players, right? And like, is it important for these older MPO oh. players to get involved? One thing that I just find always interesting is People try to make it sound like these guys are too old and they can't compete. We don't ever really talk about that on FPO. Kristen Tatar is 31 years old. She's two years younger than Paul. She's Simon's age. She's one year older than Ricky Wysocki. We, I hear this all the time about like, oh, like these guys, I don't know. They can't compete against these young guys. I'm, I'm assuming is if AB continues to play, I'm assuming, and this kind of goes back to last week, I'm assuming that he's not, when he turns 30 years old or 28, that he's just going to fall off the map. And now it's like, oh, he's too old to compete. I think you can be competitive in disc golf well into your mid thirties, well into your later thirties. And this idea, I saw a graphic that the disc golf pro tour put up saying like the old guard. And it's like, when I think of like old guard and other sports, I'm not thinking of people in their prime or like just past the prime like old guard to me is like Ken Climo playing in a tournament and playing well, Barry Schultz playing in a tournament, Schwebby to me, that's old guard, not 30 year old, 30 year olds. So I mean, I, I know I'm not going to be in the finals, but of that's that, some, of that list, that's you, of the list you mentioned, none out. of them are 30 year olds, except Rick. Most of them are in their mid to later thirties. Simon's 31 and Paul's 33. 33 is pushing it, I guess, but. I don't know. Well, how old's Colin? Uh, I mean, he's what? I think he's age? younger than 30, you think. 35, 34. I feel like, I feel like Jared's all always one guys, of those sneaky guys. All these guys we're talking about are not past 40. No, I think you're right. I think you're like, right in a sense. Like, I agree. They're not like, you should be able to be competitive. I think the Jeremy reason Colin this... is 39 years old. Okay. Thank goodness. I think really what it comes down <laughs> to though, is we <laughs> haven't seen, old. that's what it is. We haven't seen guys in disc golf yet be really dominant l- in their like late thirties. So I think disc golf is still trying to sort out. Yeah. Well, we also had Nate Doss like. retire at like the age of 30 or like 30. Yeah, it's yeah. crazy to me that people like already count out these guys. No, yeah, like, you're, you're hundred percent right. Like, From a physical ability standpoint, no, you absolutely you, could. Yeah. You can I would argue record. that in the 30s, you actually have a better chance of winning because I you think, have more knowledge, more yeah. 
more experience, all that stuff. I think what it is in the MPO side right now is that the game is changing with the younger generation. So like the courses are getting longer. You're seeing players throw it like AB, like Calvin, like Gannon. They're throwing it consistently farther than the quote unquote old guard that's only in their young thirties was ever asked to in their quote unquote prime. Um, and that's the other thing in disc golf is we don't really know what prime is. We just know that Gannon Burr hasn't hit it yet. Neither has AB. Uh, so like yeah. that's where I think you're well, seeing that, an old and is because disc golf's changing so much right now. In a sport like golf, your prime can be so fluid because age has, it, you know, even disc golf where there is a, it's a little strenuous on the body. It's still not that crazy where your prime could be at, at age 20, it could be at age 40. Um, whereas in like in basketball, or if you're a running back, your body is just going to deteriorate at a different level. So it's kind of like, we know when an athlete's prime is going to be probably when they get into their later twenties, um, or sometimes yeah. or even in their early twenties. And then, you know, it all depends on the position, but some positions, I mean, like running back, for example, a lot of times their prime is like from age 21 to 25. And then beyond that, they have so many knee injuries, they're toast. I'm hoping um, the disc golf prime starts at like 27. That's what I'm hoping. Yeah, dude, I'm telling you, I, I have not hit my prime yet. I get, when you get to declare a prime, I guess at age like 60, then you're pretty safe to be like my prime was then, you know, cause you're probably not getting any better from that point on. I don't know. Something about, it. I hope I haven't hit mine yet. Um, Jack, can we get an answer to the question? Yeah. If you're here to argue this is Kristen's fault, then you are out of your mind. This is similar to asking if the course needs to be easier so that other competitors have a chance. That's just wrong. Get better or move on to other things. As tough as that sounds, it is no one's fault but your own if you aren't good enough to compete with the top athletes in the sport. I think the reason behind the lack of parity is consistency from the FPO division. Each week that we see a dominant win like this on the Pro Tour, we see one or two other uh, women who have played consistently enough and well enough to be near the top, but then everyone else falls off. The reason Kristen is as good as she is lies with her consistency. Cat Merch this year has a fourth place and a sixth place finish. She also has a 19th and a 21st. Ailey King has two fourth place finishes. She also has a 32nd. Missy, Missy Gannon won a major last month and just came in 22nd at Jonesboro. Outside Kristen, Holland Hanley has been the most consistent on tour with four podiums, but she also has a 16th. The reason the scoreboard is so skewed towards the top is because we don't have consistency from our top athletes in the sport, as well as not having as many athletes near the top. There was a ratings difference of 104 points between the highest and lowest rated players in FPO this last weekend. In comparison, in MPO, that was 82. Doesn't seem like that big of a difference, but get this. 87 out of the 112 MPO players this last weekend were rated in the upper half of the range between the highest and lowest rated players. 87 were rated 1,009 or higher. In FPO, only 19 of the 39 players fit into the, hot, into the top half of the range between highest and lowest rated players. That math adds up to 77% of MPO division rated higher than the middle of the rate range between highest and lowest, and in FPO, that number is only 49%. Now, how do we fix this? For starters, when MPO has almost three times as many players in it, that helps, but if only nine players are realistically capable of competing for the win and five of them have an off week, then the leaderboard looks way more skewed than it should be. I like that stat. Good math. Good math. Um, all right, Cade, what are your thoughts? Do you agree? Um, I partially agree with Jack. I think what it comes down to is first, I want to know, are the FPO players practicing, putting in the same work as these top MPO guys? And I know that may be tough to say, and I genuinely do think Kristen and a handful of the other FPO players are, but really from top to bottom of the field, you can't just be on, you know, MPO tour can't be touring MPO professional unless you're dedicated your life to it. I mean, in the FPO, you can say the same thing, but it takes so much less to go out there and play in the FPO, not even from a male to female perspective, but just when you see how people handle themselves, what kind of pressure they can handle. And I don't think we've seen an entire FPO field full of that yet. And I think that's something Kristen has done and no one else has been able to do it since probably Paige Pierce and Katrina Allen which doesn't feel like very long ago, but it seems like both of them are pretty irrelevant now. And I think what Kristen has done is that she's taken, she saw where Paige Pierce was and she says, if I want to be the best, I've got to be better than that. And she has been better than that. And I think what it's going to take is for someone, you know, that's 14 years old right now, to say, Kristen Tatar, I'm going to be better than her someday. And hopefully there's 20 of those girls out there right now that, you know, five years from now, we've got 10, 20 year olds that are, thousand ten rated women and i think that's what it's going to take and i think Kristen doing this is the first step in that direction 
All right, so here's what I would ask you guys. We got to stop talking about ratings, man. I'm sorry. So here's what, <laughs> here's what I would ask you guys. We got to stop talking about Listen, ratings. Listen, a few a few. I didn't use one event, ago. Brody. What? I didn't just use the ratings that happen one random weekend for one random player. I no, I'm just their... saying. I'm just saying in general, okay. talking about how good someone is. Saying like it's just a how... stat we have right now. I, I know say it's... how good someone else is, though. They're like better the... than Kristen. Besides finishes, I don't know. How, how right. do you do it no in any sport? Talk. Wins. Literally, how how do you do it in any other sport? No more ratings talk. Listen, okay. here's here's a question I, I have because I, I, I asked a few I, episodes ago. I asked you guys. Should they make courses easier to make things interesting? And everybody said resoundingly no. But it's continued this way f- for more weeks now where, like, it is just, like, it's almost it's almost ridiculous when you look at the leaderboard and you watch it trickle down. So my question is, fine, don't change things, keep it going. But it, how long does it have to go on like this before the Pro Tour is just sacrificing a product that even if it does get better years down the road, it's too far gone. Like it hasn't been competitive. I, I don't, what product what do they, they create if they if they well, sacrifice the longevity? An interesting one. one that I would love but, to tune tre- in. Trevor, would the problem is Trevor, though? the problem. The, well, the problem. If it was close, I would want to watch. More. And if, if not, if, let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. If MPO was still playing Fountain Hills and that was the normal course for every single event, would disc golf be nearly as interesting? It, well, I, I think he doesn't have a problem right now. Well, I'm, I'm asking, saying that's I'm asking a, for competitive tournaments where there's more than two people have a chance of winning. And a lot of times we okay. one. but the problem is the problem is, is, is not um, the courses. And, and like the problem is Chris Tar is not doing anything that someone else can't do. Like she's not in golf. They had an issue where guys were just bombing the, and they still kind of have this issue a little bit where guys were just bombing the ball as far as they could and then just basically pitching it up there. And like, they're like, this is kind of not great golf. There's not really strategy or anything like that. So they started having to make fairways tighter, uh, throw up the rough, which also backfired. Cause now people are like, it's hard. I, I don't think Kristen's doing anything where the pro tour is looking at it being like, ah, the way she's, you know, look at the UFC, another example, like someone that just, you know, takes their opponent down to the ground and it just like lays on top of them for three rounds straight, five rounds straight and wins every time. Like I'm sure the UFC is like, ah, this kind of sucks. No one really likes watching this. I, I, when I watch Kristen play, it's not like she's like abusing a rule or playing the game a certain way. She's just better than everyone. No, I don't, I agree, I agree with that. I, don't, I never it's said it's a she hard was. thing to fix. So like, how just, do you, you punish someone for being better? Like, that's the thing is like, how do you at fix the, at that? The, yeah, I, I understand it's not ethical really, but at the cost of the entire product of FPO. But it's FPO, the cost of the entire sport. No, you, so, someone just has to taunt you hard in her before the event. But the sport doesn't matter if nobody, if nobody gets interested because there's only one player in contention or two. That's what no, I'm trying to say what, is like, people, people, people do like interested dominance. People, people do are more like interested dominance. in FPO right now than they have been for years. Yeah, people do like dominance. They yeah. do want okay, to see so Chris and win. What the pro tour needs to do and this is this is going to ruffle feathers but if what they want to do if they want to get the better product is they need to start making they need to start paying less players so that there are players that it's harder to make it on tour when you come in 15th place in the fpo division and lose by 35 strokes you need to be able to compete and actually compete and be competing in the top five and not losing by that many to just, actually get paid and be able I just to know them. that the Kristen thing, I get it. It's cool to talk about. It's fun to see the stats get posted. But who is actually going to continue tuning in years and years where it's like you glance at your phone to check the scores? Oh, Kristen's already up by six. Like, what, Chris, what reason Chris, is there to tune in? Kristen, the Tar fans who are the, the, the biggest fan base in FPO. Are they? Yes. Oh, More easily. than Paige, you think? Yeah, yeah. not oh, even yeah. close. Probably five to 10x Paige. My question though is Chris Tatar had one of the more expensive uh, uh one of the more expensive cards. I mean sold. their Instagram followings are pretty similar. That doesn't mean anything. I have almost it, a million been around Instagram the game followers. Way that means longer. Nothing. Didn't yeah, we just say earlier nothing. that being around the game long creates huge fan bases that bring people back into the game? Or did I miss Yeah, you so that? if someone's be able to equal that fan base as a <laughs> like, following in just a few years, that's incredible. I mean, mm-hmm. she has a much more active one. So what are we what are we using to say she has a bigger fan base? Does she sales. Mo- I I would bet that Paige and Chris move similar amounts of discs. I wouldn't go that route. Passion. The Paige I has think, the passion that Brody and Calvin are not. I'm Calvin, just saying I don't know that we home. have. I don't know that we have qualitative exact numbers to just go out there and I, say five I'm X, just 10 saying, X. I, I, just, I, we're just throwing stuff out there. 
I'm I'm just saying, well, yeah, we don't have a- absolute numbers, but I'm saying from the uh, stuff I see on social media, from the stuff I see at tournaments, it is she is one of the most popular, not just an FPO, one of m- the most popular players in disc golf. She, I, I agree she that's is right now. I just, I listen, my whole thing is, it is, as a sports fan, if you're going to draw people, like, I, when I look at FPO coverage from week to week, I just get sick and tired of not, like, the only thing to view is how much is Kristen going to win by a lot of times. I want to see a leaderboard where it's like, ooh, this could get close down the stretch. Like but that's that what was I'm Paul for. McBeth's era in 2015 to 2016. Like, imagine if they would have yeah, tried I don't, to. I don't think that was as good of That golf. was when all of us got into the sport. That was electric. It was incredible. You just watched a scene. We weren't even watching golf. live disc golf back then. It was all post-produced. You're watching Thank Smash you Bros. Terry was no, I wasn't that. really. <laughs> I was. It was if electric. Paul was, if Paul was dominating and the pro tour was like, we got to make it easy, we wouldn't have Gannon, like all those guys that are here now, Gannon, AB, that were like, I'm going to be better than Paul one day. If you do that to Kristen right now, are, are there kids saying... out there that are like, I need to work this hard to get this good, or can I just, you know, get I'm not okay saying right and now. go out to a pitch and puck? I, I only... I'm I know what you're the saying. Question is how long could it go on before it gets to a point where it's like, like well, if, if we're three years from now and the same thing has been happening for three years where the tournaments are not close, fourth place is 15 strokes out of the event. Are we saying anything different or is it the same exact conversation? That's well, what I, I really want to know. Cause I, don't I wouldn't that's... change anything right now. I wouldn't. I don't think that's every tournament. And like Holland had a well, really I did good five out of seven tournaments. Third place has been 10 plus strokes out of the lead. A lot of that's happening kind of in the, in the final round, like Holland had a legitimate chance to push Kristen at this tournament and just, she couldn't make a putt. She no, just no, it's missed. Not, it's not it's, always it's own own Scoggins. Wasn't here. Owen this and tournament. Missy weren't even here. Yeah. Own and Missy weren't here. It was a small, much uh, two of the top, literally four players in the world weren't there. No, it's so, not just this event though. And I'm not saying it's just Kristen. Well, I'm not, it's I'm not, not gonna, just Kristen. I, yeah, it's yeah, not just Kristen. It's usually, open at Austin. it's usually one or two FPO players. Uh, in almost every event, it's one or two players that separate themselves from the in rest. A weird of the season, make them irrelevant. Like in the rest a weird of the season. Field, that's that's all but I'm saying. Ricky and Paul used to do that to the MPO. I'm not saying that's good. I but don't think you, that. Cage and Cat used to do good. that. That's, that's how we got here. I if think if that if that was then, if you put the pause button and you put them all at Memorial every week, we never get here in the MPO. You just have to let it happen to FPO. I just think disc golf was consumed differently this year. I back then, I think if it was happening in MPO the same way, I would be saying the exact same thing. I wouldn't. So would I. Le- I, I think that the, I think two players in MPO just separating themselves from the field the whole time and making the rest of the field irrelevant would not be good for 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 disc golf. It would be good for the long term of disc golf because it pushes the sport forward. After how much time though? Like That's if that happened for five years, like if I, that, like I just think that gets boring. I think it gets you repetitive. Have to have enough boring. time to where the kids that get but inspired you, by it have a chance to get that good. I don't know, man. I, like, know. I, I, I think I've, people like. I think there's. I think when you have a great like right now, we're watching in the NFL, Patrick Mahomes, who potentially could go down as the greatest quarterback of all time. You're gonna have some people that absolutely love watching his dominance every single season. He's being challenged, and then, and then you're gonna have. Kristen's kind of a few times, and Kristen then you're going like to have it's not just whatever. Kristen. That's not the that's not the point I was making. It's not just Kristen. Please hear that. It is it is that there's a f- couple of players every event that separate. Well, themselves. yes, the FPO p- field needs to get better, and it's the same. You could have said the same thing about the MPO, MPO field a couple of years ago too. That's my whole point on like winning right now in MPO is not the same as winning in 2015. Like pretty soon, hopefully, if everything continues. Winning an right. FPO event this year is not going to be the same as winning it five years. Well, from that's now. why that's why my question Hopefully, was like, if it went on for four more years, would we? Would you say the same thing, or would you say maybe there's maybe there's a problem? The, the, the problem would be there's not enough interest in FPO, and players aren't just, like good athletes aren't going into disc golf to play disc golf, or sorry, good female athletes aren't going into disc golf; they're going to other sports. That would be right. the. The, yeah, the fact is, this last weekend, Calvin Heinberg, who is, no one can argue is a top five player in the world right now, had an off weekend, but there are enough people in the MPO division that were able to, you know, quote unquote, make up for it. In right. the FPO division right now, we're so small. Like, you know, I like the that math, you know, like if, if we had 39 and the top 25 is only 9% of the people or nine people, 
and four of them have off weekends, then there's realistically only four other people that could potentially challenge Kristen. Whereas yeah. this week, Calvin was off, and there were still 25 to 30 other guys that could have competed. I, I listen. The only reason, and the only reason I say all this is just, I've just been frustrated recently because I enjoy watching FPO disc golf. But when I check my phone and I see consistently, like if there's even if, if there's just two people in it, I, it's interesting enough for me to tune in. But a lot of times, this, the way that golf works is if you go into the final round just counting on the two leaders by far to make a duel, chances are one of those guys is going to one of those players, if it's a girl or guy, is going to have an off day. The other one's going to have a better one and they're going to move in opposite directions. It's kind of difficult sometimes to just have two players at the top. Whereas if you have a division where there is like, 15 guys in contention your chances of getting some kind of excitement down the the stretch is a lot higher and that's just one what i'm missing one point i just created when i walked to tell my dogs to stop barking was one thing the courses could actually do would be to actually generate more difficult courses because if someone has if chris Attar has a five shot lead going into a course that you know when she plays bad she shoots 10 under and when she plays good she shoots 14 under that that's not very interesting but if Chris is or like you look at someone um, for, for the men's on USCGC, like that's a course, a five shot lead can be evaporated within a couple holes at USCGC. So I yeah. think having courses where a bad round North Northwood black is a perfect example. I don't know what the number is that we would feel safe with crowning someone going into the final round at North, maybe yeah. seven shots. Well, it but, will be but you can shoot two over. It'll out be there. interesting to see because I mean, obviously they play a different layout, but since they are headed there, maybe maybe that will be the solution. All I know is, um, you know, whenever they played U.S. Women's a few years ago, and people didn't like the course, you know, they thought it was too soft. That that course that was like kind of shorter, and the the leaderboard was really jumbled. A lot of players didn't like the course. A lot of people complained about it. But all I know is that last day was very exciting because of how many people were jumbled up on the leaderboard. I'm just yeah. a sucker for that. That's the kind of golf I like to consume. And if you hate that take, that's fine. Listen, I, I can probably take watch it. a lot of mini golf tournaments then. Yeah, you yeah. love mini golf. <laughs> Because those, no, those I'd love I'd love what MPO disc golf has been all season. That's what I that's what those I've, tournaments are super awesome. jumbled. Everyone's 15, 16, 17 under. It's electric. But, um, <laughs> all right, we're gonna move on to the finals. Enough of that sidetrack. I just had to get off my chest because I wrote that down as a question like five different times, and I was like, I don't think anybody <laughs> cares about this except for me. So I'm just gonna ask them. Um, Jack and Hunter on to the finals. Uh gonna talk about Simon Lazat finally, since he did uh get the win. Um, here's my question. Uh, first of all. Hunter, would you like to go first or second? I'd like to go first, please. Okay. He wants the box. Uh, here's a question here. Simon Lazat has now notched a Pro Tour win in three straight seasons and has seven in the last two calendar years. What he still lacks is a major win. Why do you think Calvin has been so subject to the can't win a major narrative and Simon, who has been winning as much as anyone, isn't typically mentioned in that conversation? Given his age, should he have the most pressure to win a major of anyone? Are we still learning to see Simon in a different light considering he just became a consistent threat on tour recently? Yeah, no, I think the key difference here is the consistency over the last several years. Calvin has been, in my opinion, the guy to beat week in and week out for quite some time yet, but he's yet to win a major, even though he has been in contention. Simon, on the other hand, feels like when he gets hot, he just wins. So there's no reason to believe that that wouldn't be the case at a major. Simon, I went back, has only had one top five at a major in the last five years. That's as far as I went back. That might be his only top five in a major in his career. I don't know. Calvin, on the other hand, has had six top fives in the last five years, with three of them coming in the last like, year and a half, I think. Calvin just puts himself in contention so much more often and loses at majors so much more often on the biggest stage that that's what's created this narrative. So with their consistency in mind and potential legacy, I think that's why Calvin has the most pressure to win one still um, because Simon's brand is built mainly on off course activities, right? He has the YouTube channel. He has the entertainment and he has now become a guy who was insanely popular and now knows how to win. Calvin, on the other hand, is the new like performance brand guy where like he has a brand and like almost in spite of his personality, it comes out in like Joma's practice rounds and stuff. But if you're not watching that stuff, like this is a guy that shows up, handles business and gets wins, but just hasn't done it at a major. So it's almost a stain on his legacy where that's not the legacy Simon's leaving. So I think that's why it's the most important for Calvin to take one down is because he's trying to put his face on the Mount Rushmore, whereas Simon is just kind of 
happy to be there. And even though Simon has more wins than anybody in the last like two calendar years, that's not what his brand's built around. So that's not how we view him. Whereas Calvin, that's what his brand's built around. And if he can't get a major, much like if Ricky can't end this, like however many year major drought, those two are the guys with the pressure on him, Calvin and Rick, because that's what their brand is built on. And it has this huge hole in it right now. Yeah. Fair points. Fair points for sure. Um, Jack, what are your thoughts? Do you agree? Um, I do agree. Uh, I do agree with, with what Hunter had to say, but you said this question is about Simon Lazat, so let's actually talk about Simon Lazat. Um, I do think that Simon should have pressure on him to win a major. Um, I think when I read that question, I was like, I've never even thought, like, no, Simon needs to win a major, but he does. He, he should have pressure. I think the narrative of, you know, quote, Simon is just around for goose and for fun is over entirely. He's around to win. He himself has expressed this. So if he has transitioned to that mentality of being a competitor before a showman in his own mind, then we need to put our standards of that on him. And with those standards, he hasn't won a major and needs one to cement himself as one of the greats as a player. He's already cemented him, his, himself as one of the greats in showmanship and fun for the fans, but he's missing the M. I do think there should be more pressure on him to do it. We put pressure on Ricky Wysocki because he hasn't won a major since 2017. Simon hasn't won a major at all and has been playing on tour just as much and for as long as Ricky. Simon is getting older and all sports show that father time catches up no matter how good you are. The age question is certainly one to consider. We are in a time when the young guys are taking control. The old guard is starting to fall away and that means it will only get harder. Simon likely had a better chance to win a major in 2017 than he does now. I think this is the case because, like Trevor has said before, Simon wins because he takes advantage of stuff going his way. In a three-round tournament, it is easier for good things to happen to you and for that to be the deciding factor. But in a five-round event like Worlds, the best rise to the top. The lucky runs out, and the guy, players who truly are better find ways to make up for it. That's why we saw Paul win his four uh, Worlds when he seemed to be pretty far out of it after the first couple of rounds. I do think people are struggling to view Simon as the player that he is and not the showman and content creator from the past. I think the last time in the last two years when we have seen Simon on coverage do a Simon line was his shot on 16 at Deagle last year, and that wasn't even because he wanted to throw a shot. That was cooler and more fun. It was because he was taking advantage of poor hole design. Uh, we didn't see him throw harder than like 75% last weekend. People were eagling par some of the par fives, and he wasn't even making an attempt at him to throw that hard. He's changed his style and is reaping the benefits from it. Because of that, he needs a major. The fans want it. He wants it. His time is running out. It needs to happen now or never. I do think, um, I think it's interesting. I think, I guess it's probably just kind of like a force field that his brand has created against, um, uh, like against that narrative, because it is interesting that he doesn't get tossed in there. He's older, but I think it's just, you know, because of the, you know, maybe if he continues what he's doing for years, like, uh, like a few more seasons, we might start to look at him differently, but it's going to be really hard to like, look past his entire brand that he created, like Hunter mentioned. Um, because like I said, like you just, you still, when Calvin wins, it feels like he's fulfilling an expectation. When Simon wins, it feels like he just continuing to add these bonus side quests onto his insane disc golf career. Um, and like th this brand he's built, like that's almost the way it feels when I see them. So I'll be curious, Jack, just to see like he you're right. He meets all the requirements of a guy that we should expect to win a major and like put him in that conversation. But people just haven't really shifted their perception that way. And I'll be interested to see if like if if this happens from season to season, new fans come in and they just they don't know necessarily the old Simon if that starts to shift. But uh, I'm going to give Hunter the dub today. Um, got it done. What do you have to say for yourself? I'm really excited because, like, as you can see, I have my discs behind me. I took, like, 40. I don't even know. I took a bunch of putters for that live stream. So uh, before the stream, I was like, oh, shoot, I got to get some discs to fill this gap behind me. And I did. I walked over to a box. I just had a bunch of old discs in there. And I found this first run Zeus that hasn't been in my bag in years. And I remember it being a, like, gorgeous flip-up Zeus. I don't know why I took it out. And so it's going to my bag, and I'm super excited, all thanks to this show. Because if I wasn't on the show tonight, I would have never grabbed those discs out of that box. I wow. never found it. So what you, double what gonna, win. What are you going to replace? 68. Uh, I don't know what I'm going to break. Soft spot. I don't know what I'm going to I Brody, I popped off today. It wasn't for a break 68, but, man, I could have done it today, I think. You popped off for, like, five holes today. But hey, that's all, that's all it takes. It was, it was the important five. I was I was even or one over through six. Like that's what I could have yeah. done it today. Could have uh, done it. Dang it. And we weren't even filming that video though. <laughs> and if I had this Zeus, I really could have done it. But yeah, we weren't filming it. We need Trevor to break fifty-seven so I can break sixty-eight. 
Uh, yeah, ever since they moved to pins, the harder spots. I don't know if that's gonna happen, but <laughs> we'll see. It became it became a real difficult challenge now, but whatever. Um, all right, hey, if you ever want to submit any topics for debate night, like the one that was featured on uh, tonight's show, you can scan the QR code on the screen. Um, that'll pop up any second now as Silas is popping it up. Silas, pressure, pressure. Okay, it's up. And uh, also click the link in, link in the description. As you can see, I do put them in the shows when I like ones uh, and they fill good spots. So uh, make sure to submit those and make them as controversial as possible. Also, like if you feel like we started on something and maybe like you want to see follow ups to that topic, then feel free to kind of backpack on that as well and uh, ask more questions like that. But Thanks again for watching. Have fun going to battle in the comments. Brody will read every single one of them and count the likes and dislikes. Oh, just Brody the top ever one. do? Did just Brody ever do one. what the top like said? The top yeah, like wasn't. Yeah. yeah, the top like wasn't. Um, it was it weird. Was the, the top like was wasn't a Brody, right? No, no, it wasn't a. Uh, it wasn't like an action or something. Dang. It was like just like, oh yeah, I really like this podcast. Oh, that's good. We'll take so, that. Do you like the podcast, Brody? Did you do it's that? Amazing. I love this podcast. All right, well there you go. Yeah. He did it then. Probably not hey, gonna comments be. comments. I made it to the finals all three times with my written out answers all three times. So you lost all three, stop. baby. <laughs> Woo! King of the that comments. That is true. <laughs> it, you're starting to look like LeBron James in the finals before he got the ring. So hey, you know what? He's still, he still to join a super he's team. Still number two. He's still number two. Mm, I'm team agree Jack. Disagree. All right. We'll see you next week.